coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap. MySQL had a really bad week. We'll run down the list of recently disclosed vulnerabilities, the SSH server that allows a remote attacker full root access, and the GPU cracking monster, plus a big batch of your questions and our answers. All that and a heck of a lot more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 87 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on December 6th, 2012. This episode's brought to you by GoDaddy.com, and I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by Scale Engine. Go check it out at ScaleEngine.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the professor, Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. <laughs> hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Are you playing with something over there right as we start no, the show? What I'm do you have uh, over there? Well, I you got, got uh, my Black Friday shopping came in and I got my uh, Ooh, a 480, 480 gig SSD. An Intel 520 series. Nice. That's exactly that's what the, I want. That's the highest performance one, mm -hmm. I think, or pretty close to it anyway. So was it a decent... Highest performance one I could afford. <laughs> was it a decent deal on Black Friday? Uh, well, it was definitely quite a bit off the usual price, although yeah, it was yeah. still... Massively expensive, but <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, especially when you know it's this big, yeah, isn't that funny? It does feel a little weird. Yeah, yeah. I'd be curious to hear what you think of it once you put it in. And when are you yeah. so are you putting it in a laptop? Yes, this is going in my new uh, Lenovo. And does it have a uh, uh, 7200 RPM drive in there now or something? Uh, yeah, it has a 7200 RPM uh, regular 500 gig okay. drive. I would and then I bought the Ultra Bay kit. Oh, uh, so you can use so both. Basically, I'm going to slide out the CD-ROM and, and slide in this because who uses optical drives anymore? Right. I think I, I just got a, I just got Plus, a new laptop. Plus, it's hot swappable either <laughs> way, so I can always put the optical drive back if I need it for something. I just got a new laptop myself, and I think I'm going to uh, contact System76 and try to get that caddy because I want to do the same thing. Now, uh, I'd be curious to hear your feedback after you use it. I've noticed that my laptops run a little warmer after I put SSDs in them, and I'm curious to see if you'll see that same thing. Well, the SSD probably gets a bit warm. Yeah, but it does. It seems like it seems like it gets uh, noticeably warmer than the spinning hard drive. Uh, but you know, the right, performance well, uh, is totally. The difference worth is it. you're putting it right in the chassis, right? Uh, on the one like, I'm thinking of, yeah. 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 Whereas, see, mine goes in this nice metal housing that will help right. dissipate the heat. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's see, that's what I think I'll do with my System Seventy Six. Why? Well, I, I, now, on the System 76, I should mention, it's actually not an issue because the laptop's pretty large. On the small, form-factor, thin laptops, where, they, where like it's closer to the surface of the laptop, that's where I notice it the most. But Alan, right. Uh, I have a, mine's a 15.6-inch, and it's fairly beefy, so I, I'm not concerned. You got room for airflow there. Yeah. We're not here today, though, to talk about SSD drives. In fact, we've got a pretty big news docket and some pretty major stories, too. I... I was tweeting out the live stream tease, and I was like, gosh, look at that's crazy. We're going to talk about, wow, look at this story. This is nuts. Uh, so let's not uh, fight around anymore, Alan. What do you say we jump into our first news story, which uh, could be applicable to uh, folks who use MySQL, right? Uh, yes, it's, it's uh, you know, you've possibly already heard about it and everything, but. Uh... Yes. Did you just stop right there? <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was, anyway. <clears throat> uh a security researcher has found a bunch of zero-day exploits, although it turns out most of them are not that big of a deal. Okay. Uh, or not as worrying as originally thought. Uh, so anyway, on the full disclosure mailing list, uh, a number of disclosures were made uh, in, for problems with MySQL, uh, including a stack-based buffer overflow, a zero-day with a proof-of-concept, a heap-based overrun with a proof-of-concept, a database privilege escalation exploit, uh, a denial of service exploit, and a pre-authentication user enumeration exploit. Wow. And I'll explain what each of those is in a second here. Okay. Uh, so the first one, which is uh, CVE 2012-5611, uh, is the stack-based overflow. And if you have a, a real user, like an authenticated user account on this SQL database, you can log in and then run a command that's really long, basically by just you know putting a bunch of zeros in the middle of your command or whatever to, to fill it up. Mm. And you overflow the buffer, and you can basically cause random code to be, uh, or sorry, inject code that will be executed as whatever user MySQL is running as, which would be bad. Yeah, because on some systems, that's a pretty privileged user, not on, not on most no, well, these days. Uh, specifically, it would, it would have access to all of the databases that MySQL would have access to. That's bad enough, isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, now so that one's the most important vulnerability. But again, it requires you to be a user. You have to have a user account with a password be able to execute this attack. Okay. Ah, uh, so yeah. Um, the next one is a heap-based overflow, and uh, there's a link there that explains it. Um, the third one caused a bit of an uproar. It's um, a privilege escalation. Basically, if you log in as a regular user, you can, using the file permission, write out a file to a certain place, then use the the heap-based overflow, the previous exploit, uh -huh. to crash MySQL. Uh -huh. So that when it restarts, it reads that file you wrote oh. and runs a command from it, giving you root access. <laughs> uh, however, uh, Oracle has said that this is not a vulnerability because that would only happen if you didn't follow the instructions in the manual, which say never give the file permission to anybody that's not an administrator because it'll do this. Okay. Because they, well. they'd have the ability to do a hundred different evil things, right? Uh, and then. There's a patch, I think it's in mainline MySQL, but it's definitely in uh, MariaDB, where you can say, no matter what, the file permission can only be used in this directory, uh, which helps lock that down if you do need to have the file permission to regular users for some reason. Okay. So while this exploit, the proof of concept, actually works, it shouldn't as long as you followed the instructions and not given out the file permission to people that shouldn't have it. So... Uh, Oracle says not actually a vulnerability because it would only happen if you didn't listen to us. So, aka, you're doing it wrong. Oh, if you have that problem, you're doing only it wrong. Only if your server's wrong. misconfigured is this an exploit, and in that case, the problem is that your server's misconfigured, not that this is an exploit. What's your opinion on that? What, do you think that's an adequate well, uh, response? Kind of. It's like there's no way to fix it, really. You can't try to filter what people are going to write out to a file. If you give them permission to play with the file system, then they have permission to play with the file system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yes, you should only give that to administrators. If you need to give it to right. something else for some reason, you need to look at one of the alternatives that has something like restricting all file operations to a certain directory so that they can't put stuff in the database server directory. Like, uh, you know, MySQL has a, a directory for each database. And basically, if you put a file with the extension .trg for trigger, then every time something triggers, it reads that file and executes the code in it. I suppose if you got right down to it, too, there's probably a lot of software on Unix systems that would be taken advantage of in a situation like this. It's not, that doesn't seem... Right. Yeah. yeah, it's... it's yeah. Um, the next one is a denial of service zero day, which I, I think is also a, a different way to make the server crash and restart or just, you know, block it up. Uh, and then the last one is a pre-authentication user enumeration. So what that means is when you try to log in as a certain user, you can tell from the error message whether that user actually exists or not. Ah, uh, yeah. But that has to do more with the way that MySQL has multiple ways to authenticate. And so when you try with a user that actually exists, it says the way you're trying isn't allowed for that user. Mm. So if you purposely try with a way that's normally not allowed for anyone, mm -hmm. then you can basically get a list of the usernames that might work on that server. Mm -hmm. uh, but Oracle says that's not really news. That's, that's been known for more than 10 years, <laughs> but there's not really that much of a way to fix it. Well, okay, so this is interesting because Microsoft was in this position with NT where you could connect anonymous, anonymously to an NT box and you could have, there was ways you could enumerate the user accounts on there. And that yep. was considered such a critical flaw that they, th after, and that was one of the more pain, painful transitions they made with Windows Server f file services is they transitioned a lot of those standards and a lot of that technology to, to you know, well, know it, to mitigate Even that. in 2000, Server 2003, there was an option in the local security policy to re-enable that if you still needed it. Oh, yeah. It's, it's probably still there in 2012, really. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, the people from MariaDB, which is a fork of MySQL, are looking at a way that they might be able to resolve that. Huh, how refreshing. Uh, but, uh, and then I have a link here to threat process coverage, which is mostly talking about how, while these all sound big and scary, you know, someone saying there's, you know, six new zero-day exploits against MySQL probably makes most database administrators want to curl up in a ball. <laughs> uh, but since most of these require someone to already have an account on the database, it's, you know, restricting their exploitability quite a bit. Uh, although, you know, if you're a... Uh, a web hosting provider that has, you, you know, if you're 
dream host or GoDaddy or something, and you have thousands of users on an SQL database, you want to get these patched up right away. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, that's their job. Yeah. Uh, that their job. But yeah, the most serious one is the 5611 because that means that anyone who's an authenticated user could cause arbitrary code to be executed on the server, mm -hmm. which means they could you know, then get a shell and then probably use some chain a bunch of exploits together and eventually maybe get root. Uh, the uh, chat room, a flash update from the chat room. Uh, I haven't checked it, but uh, we are being corrected that uh, they removed that uh, anonymous enumeration in server 2008. Yeah, uh, Microsoft did. So that could be, it could be gone now. Yeah. So, uh, right so the MariaDB, which is one of the forks of MySQL, has already released a patch to address a number of these issues. Ah, uh, good. Uh, so if you use that, uh, you can update or you may consider switching to that. Uh, I use some uh, a similar fork called Percona. Oh, I was going to ask uh, you about that. Okay. They have uh although they have basically an alternative to InnoDB called ExtraDB, although because it's open source, ExtraDB is also available in MariaDB. Oh. So, it's uh kind of up to you which fork you want to use. So, you've moved away from MySQL. Well, it's still MySQL, it's just a bunch of patches on top of it. Yeah. But, I mean, it's not. And uh you get a little more detail about what they change. Basically, Oracle doesn't really talk to anyone anymore. Like the guys from MariaDB in one of these uh, links here were talking about the fact that, you know, they get these critical patch updates from Oracle and they yeah. see the changes in the source code, but Oracle doesn't really give them a list of what they changed or what ah, they fixed. Yeah. So, you know, they're having kind of a hard time trying to track mainline MySQL and do their own thing at the same time. Yeah, that's not too surprising, is it? Whereas, you know, when MySQL was still kind of developed in a much more open source style, uh, things were much better. Sigh. Well, and now we have these forks that are actually getting a lot of popularity. And, uh, yep. you know, I mean, you're using them in, pr in production environments, and I think a lot of yep. people are now. So, Well, is, uh, Percona specifically had a bunch of optimizations for when your database is backed by an SSD. And since ours are, that was important for us. Cool. I didn't know that. That's slick. Yep. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, all right, Alan. Should we take a pause here? Are you ready for a little break? Yep. You can uh, take a swig of water when I uh, let folks know about the GoDaddy.com TechSnap's premier sponsor. And GoDaddy.com has a premier offer for the TechSnap audience. I cannot believe this. You guys might want to hit the instant replay after I tell you about this deal. You can get a .com for $2.95. We announced this last week. It's continuing until the end of December. Use our code TECH295 when you check out tech 295 and you'll get a dot com for two dollars and 95 freaking cents that's incredible now if, uh, if somehow you aren't gonna take advantage of that i mean that's cheaper than an app that's 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 cheaper than coffee that's it's there's so many things that is cheaper than it is sort of sad how many things that are more expensive than dollars 95 cents. but a dot com is not one of them you can actually get up to three of them at that price too uh, we also have a very good deal going till the end of december for ssl certificates if you use our code 499 ssl2 when you check out 499 SSL2, then you'll get an SSL certificate for $4.99. Now, you could always get to .com and then do another shopping session and then use the 499 SSL2 and get an SSL cert for super cheap. And I'm just saying, it's like the, that's like crazy, right? That's crazy, the savings you can get. So thank you to GoDaddy for hooking us up with some of the great deals. And you know, using a provider like GoDaddy for your hosting, they take care of those MySQL patches so you don't have to. You just focus on updating the content of your website. Now, I am a long, 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 long time server guy. I could set up a server in no time. And I still prefer to have professional companies like GoDaddy host these things for me so I can focus on what my actual intentions are with the website or the service I'm hosting there. And when we have these codes like Tech295 to get a .com for $2.95 or our SSL code 499SSL2, these are at price points now where if you guys have been considering doing something and you just haven't pulled the trigger, do it now. You support this show and it expires by the end of December. You might have some time over the holiday break, maybe not, but take, take advantage of it right now while you can. These are just these are great prices to get at, and if you don't ever do anything with it, it's not a huge loss. You can also just support the show by visiting the links to GoDaddy in our show notes. And thank you to GoDaddy for the longtime support of the TechSnap program. All right, Alan, should we move right along with the news? Yep. All right, what, what is our next news story? I have a feeling it has to do with SSH, but that's... Kind of. It's because you've read the show notes. <laughs> oh. It's not my psychic powers? Oh. No. Damn it. All right, what's uh, going on? So, Tech... Taya, or Tectia, or however you're supposed to pronounce that, uh, SSH server, which is a commercial SSH server. They, it's the 
new version of like SSH.com's SSH server. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, has a authentication bypass vulnerability. Womp womp. Which is kind of appalling considering that the entire point of SSH is secure login. Right. And so in this case, uh, so their Tektia SSH server, which is a commercial implementation, but also there's some freeware, freeware products based on the same thing, like free SSHD and free FTPD, are vulnerable to an authentication bypass, which means basically you... Uh, for the FD, for the SSH ones, you enter a valid username, and then you send uh, certain SSH commands, and uh, then you send a blank password, and it logs you in. Brilliant. Without needing to know the administrator user password. Oh, that's, that's for perfect. For the FTP one, you don't even need a username. <laughs> there's there's some I I don't have the details right in front of me, but there's some way where you can just log in to the FTP server. With no username or password. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. That's I don't even know how that works. How does it decide what user you are? How do you screw up something that fundamentally, at its core, is a really great technology yeah. and quite secure and been around for years? How do you take that, commercialize it, and screw it up this bad? Seriously, well, how do you so, do it? So this isn't somebody screwing up OpenSSH. This is the product that OpenSSH was made to replace. <clears throat> Right, oh, OpenSSH was made to replace okay. the commercial version of SSH, ah. and this is the ultimate derivative of the commercial version Aha. that has this vulnerability. I thought they were taking like a like no, a, they're not. They're not bastardizing OpenSSH. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. All right. So Although they're just that, a bunch of screw ups. <laughs> that is allowed because I'm pretty sure yeah. OpenSSH is under a BSD or a MIT license or something or Apache license or something like that. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's an alternate SSH server, and it's uh, used by a number of different companies, and it's especially popular on Windows because, you know, there's not really uh, open SSH you can run directly on Windows without using SideWin or something. Yeah. So if you need an SSH server on Windows for something, um, then it, this is a, one of the popular products, especially the free one. It's nice uh, for doing rsync right off a Windows box to do it over right. SSH. It's yeah. nice. Uh, the free version also doesn't appear to be well maintained. Uh, their website. The last post is like January 2009. There seem to be a couple of newer versions since the last post on their website, which seems to mean that they don't announce new versions on their website. I, I don't know. The website is bad and looks out of date. Uh, so that right there would have stopped me from using that product anyway. But uh, So on SSH.com, I have a link to the uh, vulnerability announcement. Uh, and then I have a link to the CVE article, uh, CVE 2012 5975, which has the details, but basically the exploit uses the SSH user auth change request, uh, which basically says the user would like to try a different method of logging in, right? Because mm. SSH supports mm -hmm. password, which means uh, the password is actually like stored and just sent. Um, key, uh, keyboard interactive, which means I'm going to type in a password. Uh, public key, which is you know logging in with SSH keys. And there's like GSS API and a bunch of other ones. Uh, so basically, by sending one of these out of order or something, uh, again, they don't give all that much detail, but there's source code for the proof of concept so that you can figure it out. Um, Lovely. You can basically switch to the old password style uh, authentication, which isn't the same as what we normally consider password style, which is keyboard interactive where you type in a password. Yeah. Uh, but you can basically use a blank password to get logged in. Uh, and that exploit allows the remote attacker to get full root or administrator shell Jeez. on the system. Uh, there's a workaround for the vulnerability. If you edit the uh, config file for your SSH daemon, which is actually an XML file in the commercial version, uh, and basically disable all of the old-style password authentication stuff, I have a link here from the full disclosure mailing list uh, that explains how to do it. But basically, if you disable the old-style password authentication, then it's not vulnerable. Uh, okay, but okay. it appears that maybe it was on by default. Um, <laughs> of course, yeah. yeah. And of course, because it's an exploit that would allow you to <clears throat> get root or administrator access on a whole lot of Windows servers probably, uh, there's a Metasploit module already up, ready to go, so that you Isn't can... Isn't that uh, convenient? That you can uh, Just get start in hacking. there and, and Just start hacking. taking over machines. Uh Shodan HQ search results show that there's probably about 500 servers known to be running the uh, commercial SSH, but uh, I don't have the version string to check it out, but basically they, they're they sure that there are a 
much, much, much larger number of people using the free one. Yeah, as of compared, as as compared to the pay one. Yeah, and uh, because of that, there's all kinds of mess. This is a good example of why this type of remote oper- access to an operating system is best, I think, handled by the operating system vendor. Because I- assuming they have a reliable patch mechanism in place, like Windows and all the Linuxes and BSDs do, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if there's a vulnerability, they patch it as part. They have a responsibility as a platform. Right. Provider although to patch technically, it. in all the Linuxes and, and BSDs, OpenSSH is a separate project from OpenBSD. Right. It's it's not part of you know Linux or Ubuntu or. I Debian guess what my point like is though is I'm not comfortable. I wouldn't. I don't know right. if I like the I idea of buying a any- commercial remote login system. That seems like it's like going to be this well, detached piece that'll always have issues. Well, you know, if they have a better patch mechanism, then maybe it's okay. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's gonna, you know, it's open depend. source is often better. Um, Part of it is probably, you know, all the bugs like this that may have existed in OpenSSH were fixed years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, right, so uh, again, to clarify, uh, Sword Saint in the chat, chat room, room asks, if you disable the old-style password authentication, does that mean you can only log in with keys? No, you're still allowing keyboard interactive, which is where you type in your password, which is what most of us will consider uh, password-based login. Mm-hmm. But in OpenSSH, the password style login actually means the password is saved in plain text somewhere and you're logging in using that as opposed to keyboard interactive which means you are typing in the password at login time so it's very unlikely that anyone uses the password style authentication still uh and if they are then they shouldn't be (laughs) uh and so it's it's fairly safe to disable that without worrying about uh not being able to log in yeah okay any other thoughts on that one? I uh, don't. All right. Well, our next story is a Twitter story. Now, oh, don't freak out because I think when a lot of us think of Twitter, we probably forget that its roots really are in SMS. And this next story reminds us of that. Uh, so Twitter has fixed some uh, an SMS bug or partially fixed an SMS bug that would allow impersonation and account hijacking. So basically, uh, it was a bug in the way that Twitter handles incoming SMS messages. Okay. Or more the fact that Regular SMS messages can be spoofed, right? You can set the from uh, number on an SMS message to be anything you want. Sure. Uh, could allow an attacker who knows your f- mobile phone number to post tweets as you, but also do a number of different Twitter commands, including follow people, unfollow people, change your profile picture, and so on. <laughs> Great. I can have fun with the picture one. Yeah. Uh, so Jonathan Rudenberg found and disclosed a vulnerability to Twitter in about mid-August. He also disclosed the vulnerability to Facebook because they had the same problem. Uh-huh. And uh, Venmo, which is a um, mobile payment system, I'm guessing for paying vending okay. machines. Yeah. Judging by the name. Um, Twitter replied uh, asking them, you know, don't publish this until we fix it and so on. Uh, but five weeks after he reported it, he asked for a status update and didn't get a response. Uh, and so. You know, it's like you've had since the middle of August. So, mm. yeah, and you're not answering me anymore. So, well, it's guess understandable. What? Twitter is such a big company with thousands and thousands of employees. How? Oh, wait. No, that's right. They're a new web company and should be all well, on top uh, of this kind if, of stuff. If you read the um, the uh, threat post article I have linked further down in the show notes, mm-hmm. you'll see that uh, Twitter decided that it wasn't actually a vulnerability. Ah. And so on. Uh, so, the research also reported similar bugs to Facebook and Venmo, uh, and those were corrected fairly quickly. <laughs> Twitter has fixed part of the issue. Uh, basically, users who send their text message to Twitter via a short code, which is uh, like a five-digit phone number, mm-hmm. are no longer vulnerable. Basically, short codes, or sorry, are, we're never vulnerable. But uh, be, because short codes are often used for commercial messages, like a lot of times when you text a short code, it costs a dollar. Because of that, the phone company system is set up so those numbers can't be spoofed. Ah. Because they use that number to decide who to charge a dollar to. Uh, so if you're sending your Twitter messages to a short code, like I think Twitter's is 40404, uh, then you're not vulnerable to being spoofed. Uh, but if you use the long code, which I'm guessing is just some phone number you text message, uh, you could still be at risk. 
Uh, so Twitter recommends that you enable what they call the pin code feature, uh -huh. which basically prefixes every text you send them with a four-digit pin number so that someone who knows your phone number won't know the pin number to be able to spoof the text messages to Twitter. However, for some reason, I'm not, I think it has to do with the phone network or whatever, this feature is not available to users in the U.S. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know if that means it's available in Canada or not. I've never looked. You're probably uh, not big on the Twitter SMSing, I would assume. I would no. not. I uh, Twitter has disabled the use of long codes for any users who have access to a short code. Uh, so that's their way of addressing this vulnerability. Uh, but my recommendation is if you don't use the SMS commands feature, where you you know send a uh, SMS message to Twitter to say follow this person or unfollow this person or whatever, then you probably want to log into your Twitter profile and disable it if it's enabled. I don't think it's on by default, but uh, if, you've, if Twitter knows your phone number, you probably want to go into your profile and check and make sure it's turned off if you're not planning to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because uh, otherwise, people will start posting tweets as you maybe. And, and you know. We see you know, hacked Twitter accounts very often being used in social engineering type things to trick your friends into clicking malicious links. Yes. I've been getting a lot of spam. Or, <clears throat> I guess you call it spam. People... People send me at replies and it's for junk. Like it's just yeah. bots. I hate that. So it make it makes start making it noisy. Mm -hmm. So now what? Now now Twitter says okay, it's now functioning as expected. Kind of. Um, the, in the article on ThreatPost, there's some replies from uh, Twitter's security people, including I think Moxie Merlin Spike, who works there. Yeah. Um, huh. I can't find the quote right off the top of the article here but it's in one of the two uh threat post links i have in the show doc okay so you can awesome. see twitter's explanation of why they're not doing anything more well there you have it or now, why they don't think they need to do anything more i uh i will uh, I, you know, i'm just gonna go i don't think i have my phone number there but i'm just gonna double check uh, <laughs> alan before we get to the next story which could be you know actually very applicable to anyone in our audience who has 25 amd radeon gpu sitting around their house stay tuned for this next story uh, but before we go, I just want to remind folks that uh, if you're doing some shopping, uh, either for your general purpose needs or for the holiday season, just I'd like to remind you we have affiliates, and they're linked at the bottom of our website. And that's one of the ways these shows stay on there in the Jupiter Broadcasting Network is uh, able to uh, keep me gamefully employed, at least uh, partially employed, so that I can focus on making these shows. If you go down there, you see we have Amazon US, and we have uh, the UK and DE. We also have Newegg and ThinkGeek and Best Buy and Audible and Code School, which is a great online uh, uh, learning by doing tool where they have a bunch of different courses for Python and Git and all kinds of things like that. Uh, and you also have these browser extensions. You add those to your browser and that'll automatically tag your shopping session without you even having to worry about it. And of course, if you continue to find our content valuable, and Alan, speaking of value, I, I forgot to mention this to you. This is a really big deal. Guess what? TechSnap episode 87 will be the 1000th video that I have personally uploaded to YouTube, to the Jupiter Broadcasting Channel. Nice. The 1,000th episode on the Jupiter Broadcasting Channel. So let me put that into context. I would, if anybody knows a way to get the total amount of time, look, somebody's calling from YouTube to congratulate us right now. Hey, yeah. Chris, good job. This is uh, Larry uh, over here at Google. I just, I like your channel. That's probably who that was. Uh, yeah. If you guys have any tools that will tell you the total amount of time on a YouTube channel, I would love to get that number because it's probably crushingly large. And I just kind of yep. be curious because you got to figure all these shows are pretty big. So if you have enjoyed the content, if you consider value in the Jupiter Broadcasting content and you would like to secure uh, a little more uh, reliable funding, you can go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash donate where you can do a one-time donation. And when you do that, you can also leave a comment uh, and uh, we'll go on a recognition wall here. We've also just recently, well, not too recently, I guess it's been a little while now, we've added Amazon payments. Those don't go on the recognition wall, but they use Amazon. Amazon is the back end, so if you don't prefer PayPal, that's an option. And we also have these PayPal subscription options here. And uh, thank you to everybody who locks in funding for the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, uh, either by using those donation links or by using our affiliate links. And you can find the donation page at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash donate. And thank you guys for keeping us going. We love being uh, primarily crowd-sponsored. I think that's really mm -hmm. awesome. All right, Alan, so what is this 25 GPU monster story? Should I freak okay. out? Is my, is my password nope. completely uh, screwed? So there's a, there was a Password 12 conference in uh, Oslo, Norway. Uh, actually, I kind of knew about this conference ahead of time because uh, a bunch of people I follow on Twitter are there, mm. uh, including Colin Percival because he was talking about his uh, uh, password hashing algorithm and so on. Um, 
but a, a bunch of new research was revealed at the conference, uh, and uh, there's some interesting stuff. Um, so Jeremy Gosney uh, demonstrated his use of virtual OpenCL, which is basically a project that came out of Hebrew University, which I think is in Israel, which allows remote GPUs to be addressed as if they were local GPUs. So basically, you can, if you have a cluster of machines with a bunch of GPUs in them, you can make it appear as if they're all the GPUs are in one machine, making it easier to control them from an app. Right? Oh, okay. So like if you're, doing, if you're say, doing Bitcoin mining or password hashing or yeah. whatever, you run the app once on the controlling machine, and it can address all the video cards on all the physical machines. Instead of having to somehow break the work up between a bunch of separate apps, uh, so it just makes it a lot easier too. Hmm. Um, so uh, virtual OpenCL is currently closed source and only works on 64-bit Linux, uh, and only works over high-speed LANs. It doesn't work over the internet because uh, it's very latency dependent. Uh, to the point where even Ethernet isn't always good enough. That's why they use InfiniBand. Yeah, okay, wow. Um, but, you know, maybe someday it'll be open source. Uh, and then support for virtual OpenCL was added to OCL Hashcat. Hashcat is a password cracking app specifically designed for uh, hashes and, and geared more towards GPUs. Okay. So in the OpenCL version, uh, they now have support for using uh, VCL and up to 128 AMD GPUs. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. So if you have more than that, you'd have to run two copies of Hashcat. <laughs> um, and that, the, that patch came from uh, Jens Stube, uh, who we'll talk about more in a minute here. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, in his slides, Jeremy also has pictures of his machines, which are quite sexy. <laughs> Basically, he has five uh, separate 4U servers, and spread between them, there are a total of 10 uh, <laughs> Radeon HD 7970s, four 5970s, which are dual GPU. Ah. I had two of those <laughs> and one 6970 in my Bitcoining rig. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he has 10 7970s, four... 5970s, three 6990s, and a 5870. And those are connected by four SDR InfiniBand interconnects uh, because the Ethernet was, had much latency sometimes. In total, those five machines uh, and 25 video cards consume seven kilowatts of electricity. That's, that's gonna that's gonna warm up a room. That you turn off the yeah. furnace. Well, it's in some, a rack. It's designed, you know, it's, yeah. it's designed to run in a data center and so on and say. So, what a what monster! Though. Is the maximum possible capacity? I don't. Wow. Yeah, your average circuit, like a 15 amp, 120 volt circuit, has a theoretical limit of 1800 watts. Okay. Okay. That's a lot. <laughs> so yeah. So my whole rack which has two separate power drops, probably shouldn't be able to go, shouldn't go over 3,500 kilo, or 3.5 kilowatts, and he's using seven. So he's probably got at least four circuits going in there. So basically, probably each of the five servers takes a whole 15 amp circuit. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. Yeah. I wonder, That's they must insane. have special... Well, I saw some of them, uh, they have like three or more power supplies. Yeah, oh yeah. And they're probably not able to do any redundancy. They just need three whole power supplies. Right. Yeah. The picture we have here on the stream right now looks like it's. I see a three uh, server power supplies. Yeah. And uh, wow, I wonder how hot they get because they're really sandwiched close together. Yeah. They have big noisy fans. That's the advantage. Uh, but yeah. So the cluster uh, in aggregate is able to brute force uh, just SHA one hashes at sixty four giga hashes per second. <laughs> Uh, they don't have a number here for SHA-256, which is how many oh, is what uh, Bitcoin uses. Because I wonder if, you know, it would be possible to, uh, or how many mega hashes you, or giga hashes you would get for Bitcoining on that rig. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, for MD5 hashes, 180 giga hashes per second. 
Incredible. Uh, NTLM, 348 giga hashes per second. How many? 348 giga hashes per second. Wow. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to what these numbers actually mean in a second. LM hashes, 20 giga hashes per second. Which seems odd that it's lower than uh, the other one, but it's probably more to do with the fact that um, um, LM hash is so weak, it, you don't need that many giga hashes to crack them all anyway. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to that in just a second. Yeah. Uh, more importantly, uh, those are just your regular fast hashes. Now we're going to get into slow hashes. So these are the ones designed for passwords. So MD5 crypt, which is your regular, you know, hashed with a salt kind of MD5, 77 mega hashes per second. Mm. Now, obviously, that's, you know, a magnitude uh, lower than the straight hashes, right? Like an SHA, or regular MD5, you can crack at 180 billion per second. And MD5 crypt is only 77 million per second. Okay. So that's, a, you know, the crypt part is helping a lot, but that's still too fast. Of course, you know, we talked about when uh, Paul Honeycamp, the guy who invented MD5 crypt, came out and said you shouldn't be using this still uh, months ago. Right. And really, most people have moved away. Uh, an SHA 512 crypt, which is basically the new thing everybody loves, uh, 364 kilohashes per second. Kilohashes? Which is much more resistant. Yeah, so you can only crack 364,000 attempts per second. Hmm. Uh, versus M uh, if you're using MD5 crypt, that's 77 million per second. So it's definitely much slower. Uh, and then bcrypt, uh, because as we know, it's not great at being accelerated by video cards, with a cost factor of 5, is only 71 kilohashes per second. That's, wow. That's uh, a and problem. a lot of people use a cost factor of 7 or 8 now. And with bcrypt, it's logarithmic. So 6 is 10 times harder than 5. So 7 is 100 times harder, and 8 is 1,000 times harder. Uh, Scale Engine just decided that our new password database will use a cost factor of 10. <laughs> Really? Yes. Which would be 10,000 times harder than yeah. the trip with a cost factor of five. <laughs> uh, but to put these numbers, uh, these mega hashes into something you'll understand, if you want to crack a Windows XP password, because Windows XP, if you remember, has LM hash enabled by default. Right. LM hash is the bad Microsoft one that does your password in all uppercase and breaks it into two separate seven character hashes so that you can crack it twice as fast. You can crack every possible password, which is the like 69 key space because uppercase and lowercase are both converted to uppercase, so you lose a lot of the key space. But basically every valid character in a Windows XP password, there are 69 of them, uh, to a length of seven characters, uh, you can crack the entire thing in about six minutes. <laughs> That's adorable. Yeah. So, you know. Uh, not that we've considered Windows XP passwords to be safe. Right. But, you know, we've had rainbow tables that can crack most Windows XP passwords in five or six minutes. But now you can brute force the entire thing in six minutes. Hmm. Uh, any eight-character NTLM password, so that's Windows XP with LM hash disabled or any newer version of Windows. Yeah. Any password that's eight characters would take about 5.5 hours to hash every possible combination. Jeez, that's not... Uh, well, and that's because NTLM can do uh, 384 billion combinations per second. So, you know, it's obviously a lot of combinations when that means it'll still take 5.5 hours. But 5.5 hours isn't long enough if you want your password to be secure. So if you're using Windows, you probably want a much longer password. Uh, related to this, Gosney and his business partners were able to crack about between 90 and 95 percent of all of the SHA1 hashes from the LinkedIn uh, leaked password database. <laughs> I love that. That's a because new benchmark. They crack, because they could crack um, the space so much faster than everybody else, uh, they were able to get more than 90 percent. Mm. Uh, so, meaning the passwords that are left are either weird combinations that uh, they didn't consider or were very long passwords that they didn't bother, you know, they like, we're not going to try passwords longer than 16 characters or whatever. I don't know what the number was, but at some point they're like, we're going to stop trying because, you know, 
that last five to ten percent of people were using LastPass and have passwords that are this long. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The people that. Actually, uh, so I have yeah. links to his slides here because they include a lot of pictures of the sexy hardware and so on. They sure do. I'm looking at them right now. Uh, also, at a different presentation at the same conference, Jen Stube, which is the guy that uh, added the patches to Hashcat, which is the has hash cracking app. Uh, he gave his own presentation <laughs> where uh, about a vulnerability in SHA-1 that would allow hashes to be cracked 21.1% faster. Oh, that's handy. Basically, by looking through the way the algorithm works, he found that there's this uh, expansion, data expansion that happens where normally SHA-1 works on 512-bit blocks, yeah. but it expands them into 2048-bit blocks uh, using this algorithm. Anyway, uh, because, of it, it, because it uses ZOR, or exclusive OR, uh, which is due to the mathematical properties, it doesn't matter whether you do that at the beginning or the end. Mm. It means you can pre-calculate most of the stuff and then apply the ZOR transformation at the end. Anyway, the slides talk about all the details and the math that's even over my head. <laughs> uh, but basically, it means that an optimized version of the SHA-1 algorithm can be 21.1% faster than the reference implementation. Meaning that, you know, if you're using just SHA-1 hashes for your passwords, like LinkedIn was, um, then they can be cracked 21% faster. Alan, I... Uh, uh, and you imply, uh, <coughs> and uh, I don't know, but I assume that the rating we got here of SHA-1 hashes at 64 giga hashes per second was before this optimization. Uh, maybe I should dust off my tinfoil hat, but I feel like the the customer for a product like this is unfortunately governments, law enforcement agencies. Yeah, although, uh, remember we saw Max Merlin Spike has that service where you can pay him $20 and he'll crack a, a <laughs> WPA key for you. Yeah. you may, We may see these become commercially available where you can just rent time on one to crack some password hashes. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure they'll sell a few for those too. I'm just, I'm a pessimist, I guess. Well, it's it's probably the way that these guys plan to recoup the money they spent to buy 25 high-end AMD video cards. Imagine if they'd used the Jupiter Broadcasting affiliate when they had done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what well, other thoughts on that story? You guys uh, uh, go no, check out the show no, notes. Great, but, uh, great hardware porn in the show notes. But, yeah, uh, you know, Bcrypt, uh, SHA-512 Crypt, or Scrypt should be your only options for password hashing from now on. That's the final word, uh, isn't it? Right random there, notes. Folks. FreeBSD 9.1 and higher default to SHA-512 crypt instead of MD5 crypt. Alan, uh, do, you think, uh, do you think the industry is going to cohesively move towards these improved standards, or do you think we're still going to Well, have... we've seen PHP uh, implementing a new API to help uh, right. that's web a apps big, do it. That's big. Yep. Uh, you know, we've seen most uh, Linux distros are now switching to using uh, SHA-512 crypt. Right. And we've seen... Uh, BSD has done that now. It looks like, according to like, uh, uh, Stefan uh, in the chat room, uh, also MySQL 5.6 will have a SSH 512. Well, no. Uh, MySQL 5.6 has support for SHA 2.6 and maybe 5.12 straight hashes, not cryptographic hashes. Hmm. I don't know if they're changing what they do to store hashes in the database. That's what I was thinking. MySQL or not. Uh, but... Those are just the built-in hashing functions. Those are not Not the same. Not the same. All right, Alan. Well, there you go. Yes. It's uh, very bad when people confuse hashes with cryptographic hashes. I think I saw this story come across the TechSnap subreddit this week, too, and there was uh, some... Uh, it caught my attention. I didn't get a chance to read it. I'm really glad you ran down that for us. Yes. All right. With all the news done, that means it's time for the TechSnap feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of our website or starting a thread in our subreddit at links.techsnap.tv. Mr. Allen, are you ready for our first question this week? Yep. Comes from Pitor, I think. I'm not sure. Piotr. Piotr. Uh, he says, hi, guys. I just watched TechSnap 84. He mentions, by the way, it's a little difficult to stay up to date sometimes. And uh, I, saw, I saw one of the issues. You think that's hard? You should try doing the show every week. <laughs> 
I wasn't going to say it. That's so funny. Uh, all right. So uh, he says, the, uh, uh, he says uh, and the issue of how easily it is to hijack uh, one's account punched me in the face. Thanks, Alan. I mean, I use tier level everyday passwords in the middle to top secret 40 character passwords, depending on the application. But then all of my clients' passwords, you know, et cetera, et cetera, are super secure. Is there a pass vault software that I can store on my own server at home and use over the internet via a browser? Like CloudPass or something, using key, uh, using key pass, you always need to carry around the database, configure it to expose some HTTPS, blah, 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 blah. He goes on. Uh, that will, he basically is looking for something to allow me to keep difficult passwords for clients and other important accounts like email recovery accounts and things like that. Thanks for the great show. I support you guys whenever I can. Uh, and he's uh, from Poland. Right. Um, it's funny that he mentions KeePass because it's actually the solution. <laughs> yeah, only uh, maybe just of course, I only know right this now. because a friend of mine asked me to set up the server side of it so he could use KeePass on multiple devices. Okay. Uh, so basically, yeah, KeePass supports thinking of its database over WebDAV or via SCP slash SFTP. Uh, so that basically, there's a module called IOConnect, uh, although IOConnect only supports unencrypted transports, so mm. you don't want to use that. Mm. But then there's an extension to that called IO Protocol Extension, ah. uh, which adds SCP and SFTP. There you go. Uh, so basically, uh, you can store the database to your server at home or some virtual private server or somewhere using uh, either WebDAV, which you should do over HTTPS, or with like SCP or SFTP. Right. And that basically means that with your phone, you can log in over WebDAV or, or um, uh, SCP and get access to that database and keep it in sync on all your various devices. And I assume LastPass, just, he, doesn't, he doesn't feel comfortable. I don't know. I've never, I don't use any of these apps, so I don't know them that intimately. I just, I mean, I imagine, because LastPass, it's sort of inherently, that's what it does to solve this problem, right? That's ah, sort of, yeah, because it syncs across all your devices. The difference here is that the database is stored on his server at right. his house, right. not right. at LastPass. Right. Which, if you're, certain, if you're a certain level of paranoid, then maybe that yep. makes a difference to you. Now, one thing to keep in mind is LastPass does do client-side encryption before it transmits them, so they only ever right. receive the encrypted results, but I still, I still follow. Right. I'm just reminding folks. Yeah, uh, uh, because I don't know these things because I don't use these. Because the only reason I mention is it would specifically solve the problem he's looking for. It you know it has mobile right. apps, it has browser extensions, it has multiple OS support, and it, it will sync yeah. to an, to a cloud. Uh, I, I wonder also. I know a lot of people who have written in when I bring up LastPass. I always get emails from folks that say, "Well, I use KeePass and I store my KeePass database in Dropbox." Right. He mentioned Dropbox in his email. He's like, but I don't want to give it to Dropbox either. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. in this case, you can use HTTPS or WebDAV, yeah. uh, or WebDAV with HTTPS or SSH to store your database on your own server, whether that's, you know, you probably don't want to use your home server necessarily because the IP address can change and then you don't have access to your database or whatever. Uh, so maybe you have, you know, a web hosting account somewhere or an SSH account somewhere or a virtual private server or whatever. Uh, things to consider, though, is that your password database is now only as secure as the weakest device or the weakest server mm. that you're storing it on, mm -hmm. right? If you have the database, a copy of the database on your phone, a copy of the database on your laptop, a copy of the database on your computer, and then a copy of the database on your home server, if any one of those devices is compromised, they have all the passwords in the database. And I think that's a realistic consideration someone should make. Now, I, do, I think there. KeePass has support for like a master password so your database would be encrypted with a password ah uh, yeah yeah so it's a little bit less of an issue but then it's like you know how hard is it to brute force one password if i really want all of your passwords i just think when people write into the show that's an element see to me it, there's a higher likelihood that i'm not going to update something or i'm going to get lazy about it or i'm going to do something wrong than i think there is that LastPass is going to be compromised right. you're more likely to lose your cell phone or have your cell phone stolen right. or your laptop stolen than you are to I see LastPass compromise. And, you know, Although, LastPass, you know, LastPass also, is a very large target now. So, yes. but. but it also implements features like, uh, 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 you know, uh, two-factor authentication, YubiKey integration, things yeah. that would be very hard to continually add on your own, whereas they're exactly. focusing on adding all that stuff all the time. But uh, we get a lot of people that write in with the highly recommend KeePass. So I, would, I think he's on the right path. And with your recommendation... Uh, I, only, I only recommended it because I know a person who's more paranoid than me that uses it. Well, and we get emails all the time that people yeah. recommend it. So yes, I, it's, it's definitely <clears throat> the second most popular after LastPass. Mm -hmm. All right, Alan. The next one comes from Spazzy C in the chat room, and he needs help with a couple of issues. So buckle up, Alan. Here we go. He says he's been watching since TechSnap 13. He also watches Last now. Two things I hope you guys could help, him, help me with. Uh, the company I work for is a security company. 
uh, with headquarters staff that uh, has dedicated computers and field staff that can only use IT equipment provided to them by the client. We're entirely Windows-based, Windows XP and 7 on the desktop, Server 2003 and 2008 R2 on the servers, 60 servers, Exchange 2010, Microsoft SQL 2008, and it's been working well for them. But lately, this is the first issue, lately our backups are starting to fall flat, especially for Exchange. We're using Semantic Backup Exec 2012, and lately the backups just haven't worked. I know you guys have talked about Bacula before, and it looks like it would be a good fit, but can it work with Exchange for backing up or storing individual mail items? Or do you have another backup suggestion that does work for Exchange as well as Windows Server? All right, so that's his first one, and then I can read a second one after we answer that. What do you think? So yep. Bacula, Alan, have you heard of anyone using Bacula with Microsoft Exchange? There's a plugin for it that, that like, makes it work with it. And uh, so Bacula, by default, has support for Windows Volume Shadow Copy, which allows it to copy... Uh, consistent versions of files, and then there's a plugin or something. I've never done it, but I know there's a, a plugin that you can get that allows Bacula to talk more directly with Exchange to do something. And then I think there might be additional features in the commercial version of Bacula. There's like an enterprise version of Bacula that costs some money mm. uh, that might have other features. But yes, there is at least some level support for doing uh, exchange in Bacula. Well, I've always found the golden the golden ticket with Exchange Backup is mailbox level or even mail item level backup. Most yes. of the time, these types of solutions that aren't where they don't specifically license engine technology from Microsoft, they're more like entire mailbox or mail store level, which is right. not as helpful when you just want to recover somebody's deleted right. items. So, um, you know, I'm a fan of using Mailder on my. Unix mail servers because each email is a separate file. So if something goes wrong, you maybe lose one file. So here's what I, uh, I and it also it helps with it, your incremental backups. If you're backing up each individual email separately, then you only have to back up the newer emails. If you're backing up the whole mailbox, then basically every uh, incremental backup you have to back up the entire mailbox. Yeah. Yeah. And you know that right there can make a big difference if you're doing it remotely. Uh, you know if it's going over a network or something, you don't want to be backing up. The everybody's entire mailbox every day, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's going to eat a lot of tape or, or whatever well, other media you're storing on. In the case too. of my clients, they had massive mailbox sizes that were completely inappropriate. And so what we ended up doing, now this is more back in Exchange 2003 days, but uh, I, I actually tied in a Zimbra server separately. And I had a copy, of, and this is, this, is, this is an option you can set up in Exchange. I had a copy of everybody's emails get saved off to this Zimbra server, and that Zimbra server just stored it in a MySQL database. And then it was just anything that could back up that MySQL database. So then when somebody, de when somebody deleted something from the Exchange server, I would actually recover it on the Zimbra server. On top of that, the Zimbra server can hold a lot more email because it's using a real database as its back end. Yep. And you can, it has a lot better searching. Now, uh, server, I believe it was one of the later versions of Exchange is adding archive mailboxes and things like that. But this was still my preferred approach at the time. And the nice thing about Zimbra is it's free. If you're just using it for this right. purpose, so you could just try it and see how that works for you. All right, Alan, here's the second part of his question. Uh, he says, there is a suggestion that they wish to add 3,000 of our field employees to our Active Directory structure to access some of our in-house applications. Wow, this is such a typical Microsoft problem. Uh, to avoid swamping our help desk run by only two people, management wants to give the field personnel the ability to remotely change and manage their passwords. I've thought of uh, I've thought of having either a terminal server or some sort of web portal created in our DMZ for this purpose. But any way I think of it, it still seems like a security nightmare. Is there a better way? Thank you for keeping up the great big shows. Spazzy C from the chat room. Right. Uh, now it depends what he means here. If you mean, you know, I just want to change my password. Yeah. That's not necessarily insecure because I would use my old password. But I think what he means is I have forgot my password. I need to reset my password. Yeah. And letting me do that autonomously would probably be bad, yes. Or, um, you know, we'll do like a regional person. So you have the regional tech support person that has, that's in the right OU in yeah. your Active Directory to manage that stuff. Yeah. I, I, think, I think his idea, so his concern is I, if I do a terminal server, they have to remote into that terminal server, and that terminal server then needs access to our Active Directory. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't see know, a way then, around you know, that. If they're, yeah, if you just want users to be able to change their password using their old password, that would be fine. But... If what he means is, you know, people forgot their password and need to automate a way to reset it, that, you know, you have to basically have some other kind of way to authenticate the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so you, I don't know what to tell you there. I don't use Windows. <laughs> the web, you know, I like this idea of a, of a web portal or, you know, maybe publishing. You could always publish the Active Directory application through terminal services on Server 2008. 
That'd be a possibility. I think I, you know, in, in terms of raw practic practicability, you know, remote desktop protocol is solid. It's been secure. I mean, there's been right. exploits, but they patch it. I, I think yeah. it's probably so an easier way to go. A terminal server there would work for that if that's yeah. what he actually wants. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, with, yeah, your idea of, you know, just delegating control to managers for each field division or something. Then you're at least limited. It's your only right? other option uh, as far as like resetting passwords where the user is, completely has no access. Because any right. other way is going to be insecure. Let's see if we can help Brian out of a jam. He says he needs some advice on Ryu Day because I could use your advice. I work as a support staff for a small data center in Irvine, California. We have a wide range of customers. Now, check this out, Alan, including many Chinese resellers. These customers buy many servers from us, and they get set up for a variety of services, such as web hosting, video chat, game servers, etc. Here's the problem. The problem is that it is now appears that the Great Firewall in China has blocked most of our IP subnets. Apparently, we've fallen out of favor with the China Unicom. We're a small company, and these Chinese servers account for a large portion of our customer base. Do you have any advice on how we might go about contacting the Chinese government to get our IPs unblocked? No. Uh, no <laughs> additional info, though. Uh, I thought this was interesting. Same problem over here is we had um, one of our customers was a teacher in, uh, from Canada teaching in China and uh, was using, I think it was OpenVPN to get back here uh, over like port 443 or something to make it look like regular encrypted traffic. Uh, and uh, basically they figured out that, hey, that, that traffic doesn't match the signature of traffic that should be on that port instead of blocking it. Mm. And it's like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you to do. How would he go about getting like a new block of... I, a, new, a new IP range. A new IP range, you'd have to buy that, uh, either yeah. lease it from your ISP or buy a range from Aaron. And the fact that your old IP range is blacklisted by the Chinese government is probably not a good enough reason to get a new one. Yeah, he, just a little, he says his Chinese customers tend to buy the cheaper servers along with dozens of IPs to use. Almost none of them buy our denial of service protection plan, so they develop something, they've developed something in-house that stops most attacks. Uh, they also have a very effective auto uh, null routing system. We can remove null routes within minutes of an attack stopping, whereas most data centers auto null for 24 hours. Yeah. He said he found us on Google Plus, too, which is really cool. Oh. All Sounds right. like he works for, like, uh, Staminus or one of the little places down there. He should let us know. Yeah. Uh, now, this, knuck one, this next one I want to say is Nick Lass, but that's just because I'm the host of the Linux Action Show. Nicholas? Nick Nicholas? Nick Writes in, uh, hi, Alan. Hi, Chris. Uh, first of all, I love the show. Even though I originally came to Jupiter Broadcasting through last, TechSnap is now my favorite show on the network. I try to support you every way I can. I use the affiliate plugin, and I have contributed some code to GitHub. Oh, that's cool. Thank you for doing that. Uh, he says, I was wondering if you could take a look at mobile messengers on the show. I don't know if, I don't know if the WhatsApp, WhatsApp app is a big deal overseas. Here in Germany, almost everyone I know uses it. WhatsApp I've, has yeah, I've heard a bunch about it, and I know there's some security news about it, but it basically yeah. fell by the wayside while I was doing TechSnap because I don't think either one of us have behind. a strong opinion on messaging apps. I, um, you know, SMS I use, is horrible, but yeah, trusting some random third party is is probably just as bad. Um, I use a combination of Google Talk, Google Voice, and you know, that's pretty much it, really. All of almost all of my text messaging happens over Skype, mostly because it was the first one to have. Multi-presence, where I could be yeah. logged in on multiple machines and the full history would be synchronized every machine. Because a lot of my conversations, I depend very heavily on my Skype history. Uh, which I finally managed to find a tool that exports it as plain <laughs> HTML files. Really nice. That's handy. Because, uh, for the new year, I plan to change my Skype handle. Uh, Whoa. Because the one I have is, is not very useful for... Um, giving out for my business because it has the name of my old company in it. Oh. Uh, so my biggest concern there was I have like three years of chat history with my business partner that contains like every plot, scheme, plan, or instruction or whatever that we've ever done. And I really need access to that still, even if I log in as a different user on Skype. There you go. Uh, I, I, know yeah, I also make uh, extensive use of Google Talk as well. I know WhatsApp is very popular, and uh, I've been meaning to take a look at it, yeah. but with Google So WhatsApp is more of a replacement for SMS than yeah. it is for anything else. But yeah. um, As yeah. far as the security goes, though, I don't think any of us have enough experience with it. Yeah, and you know, it's probably... If you're more worried about 
the police seeing what you're doing is obviously one step removed, but yeah. I'm sure that WhatsApp will hand stuff over with the subpoena. Yeah. So it's not really that much better. It just means that your phone company won't know. They probably if, don't have a fire hose connected to the feed, but... <laughs> right. So basically, the police would have to figure out that you use WhatsApp or what WhatsApp is to go and ask them for your text messages. Do you remember the name? Uh, there was a device that they announced for counterterrorism that they could hook up in the phone company's closet, and it was going to capture... And they had a really crazy name for it. Do you remember what that was called? I'm sure it was some silly acronym for something. Uh, all right. Well, the next... I want, I'm trying to remember what it was because it had a great name. And yeah, basically, they were like, yeah, we just grab the text messages and store them for later. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's true, but that's what the guy said. Av- 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 Avad writes in, Avad? Avid? He, he even tries to pronounce it for me. Uh, he says, hi, Chris. Hi, Alan. I'm here again with another security question. At our company, we want to expose some of the internal web services used internally to the public internet so that we can easily share them. The VMs hosting the services will be running on Citrix Zen. The question is, is how critical is it that we separate the Zen host of the internal network from the publicly facing ones? Uh, or in other words, can we trust the Zen hypervisor as a security boundary? Thanks in advance. Um, we've talked about specific issues before on TechSnap. Um, yeah, it was, it was specific to Zen. Remember we talked about um, a way that one virtual machine on a Zen could steal the private GPG key from a different instance on the same Zen host? Yeah. Uh, so there are a couple of issues, although in general, you're okay. Uh, but if you're extremely paranoid, you wouldn't trust anything. Yeah. Uh, so generally, it's, it's fairly workable. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's my take, too. It's like we have seen stories, and, you know, so obviously there's possibilities. But as long as... Yeah, but most of those were, had to do with, you know, getting down to the fact that they're physically sharing the same CPU, which shares the same cache. And so there's no way around that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so generally, they should be okay. Although it might be best to have, you know, one set of Zens for your, your DMZ, your, your demilitarized zone. It's the... I the think it was kind of what he's asking. Miniature network between... Yeah. I think that's what your, he's asking. Between the internet and your... Basically, if you're going to have some virtual hosts for your internal network and some that are facing the internet, having those on separate physical Zen hosts mm-hmm. would be better then having them all on the same physical van host, it may be not critical, but if you're worried about it, you want to separate as, 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 as many as separate at as many layers as possible the internal from the exposed. Right. Um, but in general, it should be fine. All right, Alan. Now, our next two emails that came in are kind of like they want to let folks know about these things, which I think is always great. People want to pass stuff along. The first one comes from Al, and he has a passion about buffer bloat. Uh, He says, loves the show. Keep up the amazing work, Alan. Just wanted to bring something up that you may or may not want to discuss on the show. Buffer bloat! It's a topic that's not on everyone's radar. Uh, but uh, it's often discussed, and thanks to people like Steve Gibson over at Security Now, we know a little more about it. You can Google more information here, and he's also included a link to uh, uh, some uh, papers that have been published as well. He recently heard a very interesting interview and a discussion on the very nerdy networking show called Packet Pushers, where they talked about this. Uh, they're mainly Cisco CCIE guys who work at large network and data center level, but you can look at the show more if you like to uh, and uh, check out the episode. He's got a link here. Alan, have you followed this whole buffer bloat thing and essentially... Not really. Um, it depends on your application, whether it's that big of a deal and stuff, but I've never run into that big of a deal with it, and I do online video streaming. So. Yeah, he's mentioned, he's actually specifically, the main reason I, I, I brought it up is to let you guys know that uh, a little later in the interview, the conversation comes up about CDNs and loading images from multiple sources in some of the Netflix delivery system. It says it's totally worth right. Uh, so while I'm interested in seeing that, I haven't, I haven't listened to it yet, so I have no idea. Yeah, uh, I, you know, the buffer... <laughs> no comment I, at this time. I know there's people I, working on it. I, I, call, yeah. I followed some of it on security now, and I, it's something I intend to follow up on, but it's also like... Yes. If, it's, if I had the copious amount of free time that I wish I did... I would know all about this by now. But right, I don't. I know. it seems like one of those things too that like if it was a really major issue, we'd probably know, you know, we'd probably be struggling with it. But it's something I'm still curious to follow up on. All right. Last kind of FYI, Jacob writes in says uh, he says a great learning resource that you guys might want to promote on the show if people want to learn about networking is there's networking classes that have been given at uh, Sanford uh, students and now they've been all put online. They're just ending this semester, but they said they're going to start it up next semester as well. And uh, you, can even, uh, you can even get a certification of completion of the course after it's finished. And uh, he'll have a link. We have a link to his email with the show notes. And uh, it's, you know, they take their, their networking courses and put them online. That's very cool. Yep. 
All right, Alan. Well, that's all the emails we're going to get to this week. If folks want to email us, you can do so. TechSnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or hit the contact link. Choose TechSnap from the drop down option or start a uh, Reddit thread. That's what I, I don't know. I like to call it thread. Reddit thread. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then the whole community can jump in on there as well over at links.techsnap.tv. But, Alan, with all of the emails done, that must mean it is time for the TechSnap Roundup. And welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that didn't quite make it to the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them, maybe give you some links, do a little extra reading on your own. And a lot of these links have been provided by our Tech Snap subreddit this week, so thank you everyone over at links.techsnap.tv for submitting and voting on stories. Alan, are you ready for the first Roundup story? Yes. All right. Swiss spy agencies warned the U.S. and Britain about a huge data leak. Yes. That's all I had. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, um, I don't know all the details, but it sounds like uh, an IT administrator there was rather disenfranchised by the fact they wouldn't listen to him and, and change this and that the way he wanted. Yeah. And he walked out with a couple of hard drives full of intelligence data. A couple of terabytes worth, I, I gathered. Uh, it, yeah. So. Uh, and uh, was possibly looking to sell it. It sounds like this is uh, happened quite a while ago, and they arrested him and then let him out on bail. I, I oh, forget. no kidding. No kidding. Uh, but... You know, uh, it doesn't look like he ever sold it to anybody, but he might have. They don't well, that's know. kind of a bummer. It would have been that would have been exciting and fun. Uh, I didn't actually read the whole story. I didn't have time. Uh, yeah. So that's why it's in the. If roundup. you're interested in knowing what's going on there, go read the roundup because I didn't. <laughs> he uh, he carried it out in his backpack, which is just man. Yes. That must have been a nerve wracking, uh, nerve wracking yeah. situation. All right, Alan. The next story comes from Threat Post. A bug hunter finds a blended threat targeting the Yahoo website. A blended threat. Yeah, so basically, Yahoo has this Yahoo developer console where you can run YQL, which is the Yahoo query language, which is this programming language Yahoo invented. Mm -hmm. And basically, developers are supposed to have access to their own data to be able to run these queries to, to build cool things. Uh, but apparently, by using an iframe exploit to steal other people's cookies, uh, you can then run this YQL code against that user. So, basically, a combination of things with the developer console and cross-site scripting would allow an attacker to gain access to all of a user's emails, contacts, and other profile data via this developer console. <laughs> That's lovely. And, you yeah. know, uh, you know the, the bad's on me for using YQL. I've been just using YQL for years. I write everything in YQL. I really, I really like to standardize on the Yahoo platform. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we've got another Yahoo story here. Uh, the uh, Yahoo Cross Exploits going for $700, Alan. I thought. Yes, there's a cross site scripting uh, <laughs> exploit for Yahoo that someone has found, and they're willing to sell it for $700. You know, so it's coming from. Even the though they're like, it's normally worth $1,500, but it's on sale. <laughs> it's on sale. Like, <laughs> Cyber Monday. You must <laughs> buy it for $700. I just thought this is a great one to put in the roundup because we talk about this black market, and here you go. Get yourself a cross. Yeah. That's, that's not it's a bad. Like, it, uh, they That's expect it to be closed pretty quickly, uh, but you know, if you want to exploit some Yahoo people, you can pay seven hundred dollars to some Egyptian guy, and maybe you get a cross-site scripting exploit. All right, I got a story that's going to make uh, all of the Intel users uh, put down their pitchforks and knives. I have a feeling we're about to well, witness possibly. a revolt. Uh, so uh, Intel says that they're committed to continuing to use sockets for CPUs. Committed. Uh, okay. The the hubbub started when uh, a South Korean. Uh, PC Magazine posted an article. Uh, they had leaked pictures of documents from Intel's Next Platform, the one that will replace Ivy Bridge. Right. And it, at least some of the CPUs in that line are um, built into the board. All something. Uh, the instead of LGA, they're BGA or whatever. And it, yeah, it means that the CPU is soldered in. And now it seems these are more targeted towards the ultrabooks and and so on. Uh, but you know, people are obviously concerned that someday. Uh, you won't be able to buy a motherboard and then buy a CPU and stick it in. You'll have to buy a motherboard with a specific CPU on it, meaning that you won't be able to do things that some people do, like buying a lower-end motherboard and then throwing a high-end CPU in it because you want more CPU and you don't need maybe some of the features of the motherboard. Or buying cheap and then a year or two down the road when the processor upgrade, prices come down exactly. and upgrade. Yeah. Well, yeah. now, Intel said here in a statement that Intel remains committed to the growing desktop enthusiasts and channel markets and will continue to offer socketed parts in the LGA package for the foreseeable future. And then they go on to hedge their bets saying that, yeah, but beyond the foreseeable future, maybe we'll change our minds. Oh, whoa. well, is the foreseeable future a year, 
Uh, you know, is uh, it? Is but it anyway, it seems like uh, they're still going to have the sockets for a while. And I imagine Hope. server type motherboards probably still have sockets for a while too, uh, just because you know there aren't that many server motherboards, and there's a lot of different server CPUs. Right? You can kind of choose between a, a few hundred dollars for like a dual core CPU. Or you can spend a lot of money for like a 12-core CPU. Right. So what, what we're likely going to see is we'll see probably, you know, we'll see the Broadwell CPUs come out. They'll be built into the C motherboard. And then maybe we'll continue well, I, to see no, a desktop. From, from when I saw more of the pictures, it looks like some of the Broadwells are still going to have sockets. They're oh, okay. uh, LGA1150 okay. instead of 1154 or 1155 or whatever it is. Uh, so, okay. Okay. Uh, so it looks like it's probably only the Ultrabooks that are going to have the soldered CPUs. That's and not, for a laptop, that's, that's pretty normal anyway. That's so. not a big deal for a laptop. No. Yeah. And on uh, a desktop, that'd be, that'd be a little... That'd be a little yes. Uh, but, and, you know, we, we keep hearing talk about that next unit of computing and stuff. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if, if it saves a lot of money, then... You know, maybe low end PCs will the get other that. Thing, the other Intel. Yeah, we don't want to see commodity CPUs, CP, uh, no. commodity computers where you can't put your own CPU in it because that would suck. Intel also claimed they could uh, achieve a more efficient cooling if they didn't have like the latch mechanism and like the space there. And if it was all one solid piece with integrated with the cooler, they said they could get, they could achieve much better thermal results or something like that. So we'll see. Possible. All right, on this next story, uh, you'd caught earlier this week. I thought this was really fascinating. It's a look inside the Raspberry Pi factory. Yes, uh, the, one of the interesting things is the Raspberry Pi is actually assembled in the UK, not in Asia. Not in China? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, not necessarily China. It could Taiwan. Have been Taiwan. Uh, well, also like Thailand or mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. there's a couple other. I love Thai food. I love Thai food. Anyway, uh, so they have pictures from inside their plant in, uh, it's a Sony plant in the UK where they actually make their devices. <laughs> That's cute. They got a little picture of it with the Raspberry Pi on there. <laughs> yeah, they got stickers stuck on some of the machines and stuff. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Very cool. There you go. All right. Well, the next story. The next story uh, kind it's of about, uh, makes about an interesting day job that yeah. not very many people probably have. Yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it's about a mathematician who designs the algorithms that elevators use. Uh, to decide what order to pick people <laughs> up in and so on. And it just reminded me of when I was a kid, I played this game, uh, Sim Tower. It was like Sim City, except for you ran an office tower or well, a skyscraper that oh, you, know, you probably had like, like condos and offices yeah. and restaurants and stuff. I, th I think I know what you're and talking about. One of the parts of the game was adjusting the algorithm that the elevators use because you would see on each floor there'd be this little stack of people. And if people waited in line too long, they started to turn pink and then red, and then they would leave and not buy anything. <laughs> or it was like the rent you would get on an office was based on how, you know, if the people had to wait a long time for the elevator all the time, they'd move out. Or you would only get people moving in if the rent was really low. That sounds really familiar. Yes. Anyway, it was a fun game. Uh, and I kind of like tweaking the algorithm and trying to get it just right or whatever. And so having that as a day job would seem pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, so we'll but, you know, to according to the, to the thing here, the article, people start to get annoyed at the elevator for takes more than 20 seconds. Wow. That's pretty. There you go. All right, Alan, that's high pressure. Why don't we yeah. talk about this Android vulnerability that was announced? Yeah, so uh, I don't have all that many details, but it's uh, privilege escalation vulnerability, meaning that uh, you could get root on the device. Uh, I, well, so. I kind of want root, actually, so maybe I could use right. this to... <laughs> yes, it, it, there is that possibility, but it also means that, uh, you know, an app or something could get access it's not supposed to have. And it affects Android 2.3 all the way up to 4.2, so it's a yes. very wide range of Android uh, versions that are impacted yeah. by that. And apparently it's in the Qualcomm Innovation Center Diagnostic Tool, which is a kernel mode driver for Android. Ah, that explains it. And it allows attackers to execute arbitrary code or cause a denial of service attack via applications that you make specially crafted calls to the uh, diagnostic Driver. IOCTL. Yeah. Are we going to end on a little bit of good or, news? See, I always, I always, when it was IOCTL, I would say IOCTL. But apparently, I learned well at, a, uh, at the BSD conference that it's pronounced IOCTL. Oh. Oh, boy. I, I don't know if I'm ever going to remember to do that right. Yeah, see, I just still call it IOCTL. Yeah, because. yeah. I don't All know, right. I have this thing about not making up words maybe, out of Maybe, maybe I can take advantage of it before they patch it and get root. You know, use that. Maybe somebody will release, like, this tool, yeah. and then I'll, it's like, I'll exploit myself. 
That'd be cool. Now, uh, our next story looks suspiciously like good news, Alan. Yeah. Uh, so a Senate committee, uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, approved uh, a law that will now go to a vote uh, that would strengthen email privacy, specifically removing the 180-day loophole, which basically uh, the, the way the Department of Justice interpreted a law from the 1980s uh, about email was if the email sits on the server for more than 180 days, they're allowed to read it. Now, this probably comes from the time when people use POP3, and when you read an email, when you got an email onto your computer, it would delete it off the server. Now that, do they most ha- people use IMAP now, where all your email stays <laughs> on the server, so you can sync it with your phone. Now, this, that law was created in 1986. Yeah. So, did they have POP3 back in 1986? Yep. Okay. It might have been POP2. I don't know. But, but yes. whatever it was, or they yeah. had some form of electronic communications. Yes. We, and uh, and in, in that time, it was very common to that the email would be removed from the server once you download it onto your PC. And so whether or not you even read it, if you fetched your mail, then it was not on the server anymore. Right. So a law that said uh, if it sat on the server for 180 days meant you weren't going to come pick it up and so that they could have they it. They classified it as uh, legally abandoned. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whereas the way people consider it now if you left a letter on your desk for 180 days, you wouldn't expect that meant the police could come into your house and read it. Right, right. And with the way things like Gmail are structured, where they intend oh, yes, for you and to... Gmail and, or even just, you know, most people use IMAP for their mail. Yeah. And with IMAP, the whole idea is you leave the messages there so that when you're on your phone, you can search them. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, oh and, yeah. So, yeah. It's like a database for me. Yeah. And yeah. so it, it, the law needs to be changed. Uh, and... The yeah. EFF is generally pleased with this, it, although well, okay, it's worth there's pointing always more out. to be done. We, we went into a lot of detail on episode 27 on Filter with the whole ITU and wanting to put tolls on, on, on you know, internet boundaries and this particular law. We dodged a major bolt with this one. The initial draft of this that passed actually gave them full fettered access to email uh, without right. the 180-day restriction. It was just, yes, you uh, get it. The, a Democrat proposed fixing the 180-day loophole and it went from there. Yeah, um, so they got they got it now, and we covered the whole sort of we covered I don't have the a, journey. We don't have a link or anything, but there was also the story that the uh, U.S. was it the Congress, I think it's yeah, voted like three hundred and eighty some odd whatever the number is to zero to uh, not listen to the ITU. Right. Yeah. 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 They, yeah. The yeah. EU did similar, although I think they had four people vote for listening. Mm-hmm. And in the states, it's like how often does anything in the states ever go everybody to zero? <laughs> Go check out uh, episode uh, 27 of Unfilter for more on that and the clips from the floor of it happening. We got all that in there, so go check out 27 if you're curious. All right, Alan. Boom! I think that's the end of this week's episode, isn't it? It's a big Uh, show. I felt like that was big. I felt like we covered some good stuff, some big stuff, answered some questions, but we need more emails now, folks. So send in your email, techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Or join us live and hang out in our awesome IRC chat room. We're live on... uh, Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Sorry, 2100 UTC. There you yeah, go. Time zones anyway. Over at jblive.tv for a video feed and jblive.info for uh, mobile and desktop audio feeds. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning to this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you right back here next week. 